Um, it's my privilege to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Phil Riken is the senior minister at 10th Presbyterian Church, a historic church in Philadelphia, where he's preached since 1995. He's a graduate of Wheaton uh, and Westminster Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania and the University of Oxford, where he's received his doctorate in historical theology. Um, he's written all kinds of different works in different areas, about 20 different books authored and edited. Some of them you may know, Written in Stone, The Ten Commandments, and Today's Moral Crisis. He Speaks to Me Everywhere, Meditations on Christianity and Culture. Uh, more recently, Art Arts for God's Sake, A Call to Recover the Arts. Uh, and City on a Hill, Recovering the Biblical Pattern for the Church in the 21st Century, and a host of other works, including two commentaries in the uh, Reformed Expository Commentary Series. Uh, Dr. Reichen is also a council member of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, and he's one of their Bible teachers, has a radio program there. Uh, he lives with his wife, Lisa, and five children, correct? Yes, five children. Uh, of, I think he is engaged with playing basketball with them quite a bit as well. And apparently he's a Cardinals fan, even though he lives in Philadelphia. Uh, we're just really delighted to have Dr. Reichen here because in many ways he just epitomizes what we're trying to do in the Scripture and Ministry Lecture Series a commitment to scripture, theology, and thinking theologically, uh, rigorously, and yet also a great love for the church and a desire to integrate those together. And on top of that, a keen interest in engaging with culture and critiquing culture. And so we're very happy to have Dr. Reichen uh, with us today. His lecture today is entitled, The Suffering and the Glory, Pastoral Ministry in Union with Christ. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Reichen? Well, it's a real privilege uh, to be with you at Trinity Divinity School and particularly a privilege to do something connected with the Henry Center and uh, to explain why I want to tell you a little story. In the, uh, in the spring of 1992, I uh, unexpectedly received a phone call and I answered the phone and I said, hello, this is Phil Riken." And the voice on the other end said in a kind of gravelly voice, this is Carl Henry. And I didn't have any personal connection with Dr. Henry at all, but he was part of a very small board. It was Carl Henry and Charles Colson and the attorney for the uh, prison fellowship, pretty high powered board, if I may say so. And they uh, were, uh, involved in sending American pastors or students just coming out of seminary to do short intern internships, three-month internships with William Still, who was the uh, senior pastor of the Gilcomston South Church in Aberdeen, Scotland, a uh, great city church. Mr. Still had been in that pulpit for more than 50 years. He started there uh, the week that World War II ended and had been preaching there weekly uh, since then. And uh, what a great opportunity that was for me to go on that internship. I was at that point uh, leaving seminary, going on to Oxford to do doctoral work, but fully intending the whole time to go into pastoral ministry. And it was a wonderful opportunity to see a model of gospel ministry in the city, faithfulness worked out over the course of a lifetime. And uh, not to forget my calling to pastoral ministry, even as I was pursuing uh, advanced uh, theological work. And I've always been grateful uh, to Mr. Colson and, uh, and to Dr. Henry uh, for the invitation to participate in that program. And in fact, some of the lessons uh, learned during the summer of that internship, in a way, are reflected a little bit in some of the things that I'll be talking about. I had an opportunity to report on the things that I learned uh, to Dr. Henry, but uh, these are further reflections on some of those topics. I hope he would be pleased. I am speaking on the subject, the suffering and the glory, pastoral ministry in union with Christ in the area of pastoral theology. It's been my observation that practical theology is often criticized for not being all that practical Sometimes we hear that even about fine seminaries. But it's been my observation that often there's a di another difficulty, which is that practical theology isn't always that theological. Uh, 
And so I want to work uh, with you this afternoon in theology, a Trinitarian, gospel-driven theology that is practical, that is biblical, that delineates from Scripture the doctrinal dimensions of gospel ministry. And I want to take for my starting point the great apostolic aspiration of Philippians 3, verses 10 and 11. These are words that uh, you would see on the wall of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. They're also the words that were preached on on the occasion of my own ordination. I'm sure you know these words well. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. And my thesis, very simply, is that pastoral ministry is to be exercised in union with Christ, both in His humiliation and in His exaltation. Now, let me take some time to explain those doctrinal categories. There should be little question, I think, as to the importance of the doctrine of union with Christ. Being connected to Christ is one of the central concerns of the New Testament. Over and over again, we find the Apostle Paul, including right in Philippians chapter 3 in verse 9, emphasizing the necessity of being found in Christ. And this is because all of the blessings of salvation are located in Christ. And so Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. This is the vital, unitive relationship that virtually comprehends our salvation. We are saved in Christ. It also summarizes the whole Christian life. That life that we now live is a new life in Christ. Indeed, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Given the uh, consistent biblical emphasis on being in Christ, the doctrine of union with Christ properly uh, occupies a central place in systematic theology and really provides the context for our whole experience of the Christian life. If we are united to Christ, then we are united to Him at all points of His activity on our behalf. Incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, glorification. We were predestined and elected in Christ. It is on the basis of our union with Him that we are justified. It is by the uniting work of His Spirit that we are adopted, by the, uh, holy, the holy, holiness producing work of the Spirit that we are sanctified. It's in Christ that we persevere. It's into His image that one day we will be glorified. And so as John Murray has written, union with Christ is really the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation, embracing the wide span of salvation from its ultimate source in the eternal election of God to its final fruition in the glorification of the elect. Without beginning and without end, every aspect of salvation is wrapped up in union with Christ the central dogmatic principle that unites the various doctrines of soteriology. This doctrine of union with Christ was a prominent theme in the theology of the Reformers. Uh, to give perhaps the most notable example of that, it was one of the fundamental principles of Calvin's Institutes. We must understand, said Calvin, that as long as Christ remains outside of us, and we are separated from him, all that he has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value for us. All that he possesses is nothing to us until we grow into one body with him. And Calvin went on to describe a kind of double bond that unites us to Christ. On God's part, that bond is produced by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit unites us to Christ by faith. By the faith that the Spirit provides, we bind ourselves to Christ. By His Spirit, Christ binds us to Himself, 
and thereby, says Calvin, makes us participants not only in all his benefits, but also in himself. This is the joy, this is the grace of salvation, not that simply that we have the benefits of Christ, but that we have Christ himself. This is a union with Christ that finds its ultimate basis in the incarnation and also in what Calvin calls the wonderful exchange whereby Christ was pleased to present our flesh as the price of satisfaction of God's righteous judgment and in the same flesh to pay the penalty that we had deserved. Many later theologians adopted Calvin's emphasis on union and communion with Christ. It's particularly prominent as a doctrine among the Puritans who considered union with Christ to be the conduit for all spiritual life and the fountainhead for every spiritual blessing. Here is how the Puritan John, John Preston described the experiential aspect of the doctrine. He said, there is a union made between Christ and us when he comes into the heart, when he dwells in us and we in him, when Christ is so brought into our hearts that he lives there, and when we are so united to him that we live in him, when he grows in us as the vine in the branches and we grow in him as the branches in the vine, a common Puritan metaphor used to explain the doctrine. When faith has done this, Preston says, then it is an effectual faith when it knits and unites us to Christ. And when you hear this language of union and connection with Christ and communion with him and all of his grace and all of his benefits, you quickly understand that this doctrine is not a matter of some sterile speculation, but it pulses with the heartbeat of genuine piety. The heart of the believer joined to the Savior of, the, of love. As the old Princeton theologian Archibald Alexander insisted, if Christ be in us, there will be communion. He will sometimes speak to us. He will speak comfortably to us. He will give tokens of his love. He will invite our confidence and will shed abroad his love in our hearts. And if Christ be formed within us, we will not be ignorant of his presence. Our hearts, while he communes with us, will sometimes burn within us. This is a little bit of the broad outline of the doctrine of union with Christ as it has been uh, given to us in the scriptures and also by some of the great theologians in the tradition of the Reformation. And when the Puritans spoke about union with Christ, they, they often made a distinction between two aspects of the work of Christ, his humiliation and his exaltation. Humiliation was the work of Christ primarily in suffering and in dying for sin. So according to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, his humiliation consisted first in his being born, and that in a low condition, made under the law, undergoing the miseries of this life, suffering the wrath of God and the cursed death of the cross, in being buried and continuing under the power of death for a time. This was Christ's work of humiliation. Exaltation is the work of Christ in conquering sin and death through his resurrection and ascension, his rising again from the dead on the third day, his ascending to heaven, his sitting on the right hand of the Father, and his coming again to judge the world at the last day. All of this was involved in the exaltation, the lifting up of Christ. And clearly both of these works are in view, both humiliation and exaltation in Philippians 3, 10 and 11. Because here the apostle describes both the sufferings and the glories of Christ. I want to know Christ and, he says, a, an exegetical and, I believe. In other words, what follows explains what he means by knowing Christ. And what he means is this, knowing Christ in his crucifixion and his resurrection, sharing in his sufferings and also participating in his glory. Paul wanted the kind of fellowship with Christ or union with him in which all that Christ had done for him in his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, all of that was brought into his life through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. 
And you will remember, of course, that in the prior chapter, that is in Philippians chapter 2, the apostle had traced the grand trajectory of Christ's work, the great parabola of redemption that swept from equality with God down to the obedience of the crucifixion and then back up to the highest place. In order to accomplish salvation, God the Son went from glory to glory by way of the cross. And when the Apostle Paul looked at all of that, he said, now that's the Jesus I want to know. That's the Jesus I want to know in my own personal experience, the humiliated and the exalted Christ, the one who suffered and died and rose again. He wanted to be united to Christ both in his humiliation and in his exaltation. Now, in order to attain this knowledge of Christ, it was necessary for Paul to declare spiritual bankruptcy. He talks about that in the early verses of Philippians chapter 3. All of those things that he had formerly counted as assets, his ethnic heritage, his educational pedigree, his ecclesiastical background, his ethical standards, all of those things that would perhaps credit him as righteous before God, all of those things had to be written off actually as liabilities. And furthermore, compared to the superlative joy of knowing Christ, Paul calculated that his religious achievements added up to nothing more than a pile of refuse. The best thing, the most valuable thing, the surpassingly great thing was to know Christ and to be found in Him. And so Paul gave up everything else in order to be united to Christ, receiving in Him salvation by faith. And now as he comes to verses 10 and 11, he says that his burning and passionate desire is to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. And in one sense, this uh, is a very surprising aspiration for the apostle to have. It's a very surprising declaration for the apostle Paul, of all people, to say that what he really wants is to know Christ. Because if anyone knew Christ already, it would have to be the apostle Paul. He had known Christ for decades, ever since he had met him on the Damascus Road. And immediately prior to this, in chapter 3, verse 8, he had testified from his own experience, to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. But apparently, and maybe you've had this experience, knowing Christ only made the apostle want to know Christ all the more. And he wanted to become ever more closely identified with the crucified and glorified Christ. Now, I suppose these verses usually are taken as a general comment on the Christian life. You Come to Philippians 3, 10 and 11, Paul is speaking about being united to Christ in humiliation and exaltation. It seems like he's referring generally to the life that we have in Christ, a life conformed to the realities of the cross and the empty tomb. But I believe that what the apostle says about being united to Christ should also be considered specifically from the vantage point of Christian ministry. And having very briefly just reminded you of the content of the doctrine of union with Christ, I want to focus in the rest of our time together on Paul's aspiration, not simply as a believer, but as a minister of the gospel. It is in his ministry, more than anywhere else, that God would satisfy his desire to be humiliated and exalted with Christ. And so, like everything else in the Christian life, a ministry of word And sacrament is for us to be exercised in union with Christ. And this provides us, I think, a paradigm for a theology of pastoral ministry. The pastoral ministry is carried out in union with Christ, both in his crucifixion and his resurrection. Now, if we were to follow the pattern of Christ's own ministry in which the cross came before the crown, we would begin with the sufferings of ministry. First, the sufferings, then the glory. Pastoral ministry is not simply a matter of life and death, although it is that, but a matter of death, then life. We share in his sufferings, the apostle said in Romans chapter 8, in order that we also may share in his glory. And here in Philippians 3, 10 and 11, 
he leads us to expect pastoral ministry to contain both suffering and glory, and perhaps both of those things in equal measure. I've been helped by the words of Stu Weber, who has said that the pastor who is most Christ-like is not the one who is most gloriously fulfilled in every moment of his ministry, but the one whose ministry has in it unbelievable elements of crucifixion. Do you believe this? Have you experienced it? Will you embrace it? That it is the crucified preacher who is able to preach the crucified Christ. And if you consider the biblical history of gospel proclamation, it is primarily a story of suffering. Few of the biblical preachers were successful, at least by any worldly standard. And for every apparent success, there are dozens of failures and flameouts. For every man who turned the nation back to God, many others were mocked and persecuted, some so severely that they were tempted to leave the ministry or even to despair of life itself. God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. And if I were looking at that in terms of multiple choice, I would be hoping for some third option. If the A is being killed and the B is being persecuted, isn't there some kind of C? Well, consider the Old Testament prophets. Their call narratives certainly make for inspiring reading. However, what most of them were called to do was to suffer. Think of Samuel hearing God's voice in the night. One of the very first Bible stories I can remember my father reading to me in the evening at bedtime. Well, the message he received made his ears tingle with fear. Judgment on Eli, his father in the faith. You can't just take the first part of that story and Eli hearing the call in the night without also considering the message that he was given to preach. Or think of Jeremiah, who from the very moment of his calling was assured that God would always be with him, but at the same time he was informed that the entire nation, all of the people, all of the priests, all of the politicians would fight against him. That was right there in his call in Jeremiah chapter 1. Or think of Isaiah, maybe the most thrilling, inspiring call narrative of all, with that great response, here am I, send me, a verse that has launched a thousand missionaries. But what was Isaiah sent to do? God said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding, ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Is that the job description you would like for ministry? From the outset, here is a preaching ministry apparently doomed to fail, at least if the goal of a preaching ministry is to turn people back to God. Its purpose was not to help people come to faith, but to confirm them in their unbelief. Many of the prophets faced rebellion from the people of God, supremely Moses, who had people grumbling about his leadership style from the very beginning, and then when he's ready to take them into the promised land, they decide they don't even want to go. Other prophets suffered persecution. Think of Elijah, maybe the most successful prophet in the Old Testament. He saw the fire come down from heaven. He watched the people fall down on their faces in the dust and say that the Lord is God. He had the uh, privilege or opportunity to kill hundreds of false prophets. I mean, what prophet wouldn't want to do that? And yet the next day, he is afraid of his enemies. He runs for his life. His discouragement leads, I think, to depression. He certainly begs God to take his life. Or consider Jeremiah, if you need another example. Such a difficult ministry that the ancient rabbis called him the weeping prophet. He was tormented by false prophets, beaten, imprisoned, left to die more than once, mocked for being the servant of God. And at the end of his life, he saw the city he loved surrounded and destroyed, and the people he loved suffering and dying in the streets. Little wonder that Jeremiah, like Elijah, once cursed the day that he was born. And even this very brief survey shows, I think, how the Old Testament prophets anticipated the sufferings of Christ. The New Testament says of Moses, this is Hebrews chapter 11, but really it could be said of all of the prophets, they suffered disgrace for the sake of Christ. 
Or I think you could say it another way, if you thought about it theologically, they suffered in union with Christ. Their sufferings were connected to his sufferings, which is why Jesus, you'll remember, was able to prove the necessity of his own humiliation from what those prophets endured. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? He asked his disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And so Jesus suffered many indignities at the hands of the evil men who plotted to have him killed. At various times, he was accused of illegitimacy, of ignorance, of insanity, of demonic influence. And eventually, he was unlawfully arrested, unfairly tried, unjustly convicted, unmercifully beaten. And then the greatest suffering of all, the cross itself, where he died naked, a God-forsaken death. And that was the apotheosis, the culmination of all of the humiliation suffered by all of the prophets. As Stephen said in his sermon before the Sanhedrin, was there ever a prophet that your, your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. And very remarkably, at the time of his death, Jesus had virtually nothing to show for his ministry. Nearly everyone had rejected him, relatively few followers to begin with, but at the end, barely 11, and even they abandoned him. His ministry turned out at that point to be no more successful than Isaiah's. People were forever hearing Jesus, but never understanding him, forever seeing his miracles, but not perceiving his message. And so as the man of, as the man of sorrows... He suffered in all of this. Oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? I, I find the lament of that suffering servant to be recorded in the book of Isaiah in chapter 49. And there we read, He, that is God, said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, and do you not hear in this verse, the words of the Messiah, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Because at the time of his death, the preaching ministry of Jesus Christ could hardly be considered anything except a failure. The main thing it seemed to accomplish was getting him killed. And what of his followers? What shall we say about their sufferings? Think of what happened to the original disciples. According to the Best of historical records, nearly every one of them dying a violent death. Or think of Stephen, who, as the scripture records, preached only one great sermon before being stoned. And these men suffered these things because they were united to Jesus Christ in his sufferings and death. And of course, the one who suffered the most excruciating torment was Paul. When Paul first came to Christ, God, in his mercy, showed to him what he would suffer for the sake of the gospel. This is part of the conversion narrative in Acts chapter 9. And suffer he did. Trouble, hardship, distress, frequently imprisoned, often on the run, in danger by land and by sea, whipped, beaten, stoned, left for dead. To this very hour, he wrote, we go hungry and thirsty, we are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world, and beyond that, all of the things that Paul suffered in ministry, his anguish for lost souls, his ceaseless spiritual concern for the church, his tearful entreaties with Christians who are struggling to follow Christ. And what all of that means is that Paul's prayers were answered, that he did share in the sufferings of Christ, that his ambition to know Christ in his sufferings was fulfilled in his life and most of all in his ministry. And before we go on to the resurrection and the glory, I want to ask, what does this litany of misery teach us about pastoral ministry? Well, one thing it teaches us is that a call to pastoral ministry is not to be trifled with. One night at bedtime, I was reading to my four-year-old son the story of Stephen, and I explained that God's servants often uh, 
suffer for preaching the Word of God, they suffer for speaking the truth about God, and sometimes they are even killed. Are they going to kill you, Daddy? He asked, which I thought at that point was really a fair question, given the biblical history. That's, that would be a reasonable question to ask about the entrance into pastoral ministry. Any minister who knows his Bible can hardly expect to escape suffering, especially for the cause of Christ. Martin Luther said this, those who are in the teaching office should teach with the greatest faithfulness and expect no other remuneration than to be killed by the world, trampled underfoot, and despised by their own. Teach purely and faithfully, and in all you do, expect not glory but dishonor and contempt, not wealth but poverty, violence, prison, death, every danger. Now, I suppose some especially those of us who enjoy all of these comforts of the Western world, may object that this view of gospel ministry is unduly negative. I mean, is it really that bad? No doubt Luther's comments were colored by his own time and place, the difficulties that he faced. But wouldn't you agree with me that any authentic pastoral theology ought to be adequate to the task of ministry under conditions of the most extreme hardship? such as, frankly, many ministers suffer today in many parts of the world. The truth is that being united to Christ in the ministry of the gospel always involves conflict within the church and some measure of opposition from outside the church. Inevitably, there will be unfair criticisms, unfortunate misunderstandings, unfounded rumors, perhaps unjust accusations, and if you are in ministry, I, I ask you, have you not had those kinds of hardships in ministry? They cannot be avoided. They are to be expected. It is simply a fact. The sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Ministry could not be in union with Christ unless it entailed difficulty, discouragement, and even at times death. Nevertheless, I believe many ministers are surprised by suffering. Could this be the reason why some become discouraged, some unproductive, some too many leave the ministry altogether? Could it be that sometimes there has been a failure to grasp the implications of ministry in union with a crucified Christ? I think the words of Thomas Akempis are striking in their contemporary relevance. Jesus today has many who love his heavenly kingdom, but few who carry his cross. Many who yearn for comfort, few who long for distress. Plenty of people he finds to share his banquet, few to share his fast. Everyone desires to take part in his rejoicing, but few are willing to suffer anything for his sake. Many that follow Jesus as far as the breaking of the bread, few as far as the cup of suffering, many that revere his miracles, few that follow him in the indignity of the cross. How rare it is then to find a minister who truly desires fellowship with Christ if it includes sharing in his sufferings, not simply to endure difficulty, but actually to embrace it, that this is part of the aspiration of ministry. This is what Paul says, I want to know Christ, and I want to know in this way, I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. The emphasis there is on knowing Christ, but that knowledge of Christ is specifically placed in the context of sharing in his humiliation. Surely this is something that flies in the face of the career goals of the average pastor. Is this something that we would be able to say honestly and sincerely? If so, it is not something that comes from our human nature, but only from the Spirit of God. In his epistles, the Apostle Paul often reflected on the role of suffering in gospel ministry. And I think as you read the things that Paul says about his own ministry, I think you see this, this perspective of humiliation and exaltation running through virtually everything that he says about what it means to be a minister of the gospel. And one of the striking things about so many of those passages is his manifest joy in the suffering he endures for the cause of Christ. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, 
He writes in Colossians chapter 1, or to the Corinthians, I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties. You see, it is true that Paul really did want to know Christ in the fellowship of his sufferings. He was like those apostles in Jerusalem who left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Now, there were two reasons for Paul's readiness to share in the sufferings of Christ. One was his belief that these sufferings were necessary for the salvation of the lost. The world could not understand the message of the cross unless those who preached it were themselves marked by its suffering and shame. I think this is the meaning, at least in part, of Paul's enigmatic claim in Colossians chapter 1. I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. Not a comment, I believe, on the extent of the atonement, but something that has everything to do with missions and evangelism. What is still lacking is the communication of the gospel by a suffering church. The unsaved people of the world cannot see Jesus hanging on the cross, but they can see a community that shares in his sufferings and that therefore confirms the truth of his passion. The sufferings of the apostles, and I think by implication we could extend that, the sufferings of the church in the world today, the sufferings of those who labor in the ministry of the gospel, these things are public demonstrations of Christ and of his cross. And so Paul described himself as part of a procession being constantly led out to die in the arena or to die for the honor of a conquering king. This was really part of his strategy for making known the crucified Christ. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. And so this is one of the reasons for Paul's readiness to share in the sufferings of Christ. It is partly because he believes it is essential for the evangelization of the lost. But there is another reason. It was because knowing Christ in his sufferings brings a deep personal knowledge of Christ and perhaps one that can come in no other way. This is one of the promised blessings of gospel ministry. George Whitfield once observed, ministers never write or preach so well as when under the cross. The spirit of Christ and of glory then rests upon them. Anyone in pastoral ministry inevitably faces one form of suffering or another, and in the fellowship of sharing those sufferings with Christ, we enjoy the fruit of our union and communion with him. In his Latin translation, Jerome rendered this phrase, the fellowship of his sufferings from Philippians chapter 3, as the society of his passion. And it is during times of hardship and difficulty that the minister most becomes a member of that intimate society, experiencing the closest possible identification with Christ. And at the same time, marvelous to say, Christ makes the closest possible identification with his suffering ministers. Paul learned this when he was on the other side of the kingdom at the time of his conversion when the Lord said to him, I am Jesus of Nazareth whom you are persecuting. And you see what Jesus is doing in that. He is identifying himself with the sufferings of his own people and particularly those who are laboring in ministry. The persecution of the church is tantamount to the persecution of Christ himself. He so unites himself to his people that he regards every incarceration and every abuse that they endure as an assault on his own person. And all of this explains why Paul wanted so very badly for the humiliation of Christ to be worked out in his own life and ministry. Didn't desire the sufferings themselves, that's not the point. He desired the fellowship of sharing them with Christ. He reasoned that since he was a minister of the gospel, difficulties were bound to come, and when they did come, it would be better to experience them in union with Christ. Paul knew that hardship is woven into the fabric of every faithful pastoral ministry. This is not only to be expected, but also embraced as part of the minister's communion with Christ. Indeed, it is one of God's gifts. It has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. Now, this does not mean that suffering needs to be sought out. It will come on its own. 
according to the will of God in the measure and in the manner that he intends. It will come in all of the sorrows a shepherd shares with his flock and in all of the burdens that he bears on their behalf. It will come in grieving for the destructive power of sin in the lives of people you love. It will come in sharing the tears of their losses. It will come in all of that shepherding work. And in the meantime, there are other ways for a minister or someone preparing for ministry to nurture communion with the crucified Christ. You can't schedule your own suffering. But the kind of intimacy that the apostle was talking about comes also not just from outward suffering, but also inwardly from dying to self. This, too, is part of what it means to be united with Christ in his death, following the way of his cross in the mortification of personal sin. We must be able to say with the apostles, we do not preach ourselves. We preach Christ crucified. But to preach that way, you have to also be able to say, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And so as one aspect of union with Christ, the pastor must die to self in all of its hideous forms, self-indulgence, self-aggrandizement, self-love, self-will. You must be dead to pride, dead to financial gain, dead to people-pleasing, recognition and approval. All of it has to be put to death if you are to know Christ in the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. The notable Scottish minister, William Still, the great man, truly, that Carl Henry helped send me to study with, he gave his spiritual autobiography a very telling title. He called it Dying to Live. And in it he wrote this, the deaths that one dies before ministry can be of long duration. They can come hours and days before we minister, before the resurrection experience of anointed preaching. And there's another death afterwards, sometimes worse than the death before. From the moment that you stand there, dead in Christ, and to everything that you are and have and ever shall be and have, every breath that you breathe after that, every thought you think, every word you say, indeed you do, must be done over the top of your own corpse or reaching over it when you're preaching to others. Then it can only be Jesus that comes over and no one else. And I believe, said Mr. Still, that every preacher must bear the mark of that death. Your life must be signed by the cross, not just Christ's cross, there's no other cross than that, but your cross in his cross, your particular and unique cross that no one ever died, the cross that no one ever could die, but you and you alone, your death in Christ's death. I think that's a very apt description of part of the fellowship of sharing in Christ's suffering, which comes not just from outward suffering, but also from death to self. Now, Paul had much to say about knowing Christ in his sufferings and death, but he also understood that union with Christ entails exaltation. And in our time remaining, I want to talk about this as well, not just the suffering, but also the glory. And remember, what we are really talking about here is gospel ministry. It's, and the gospel is not just the cross, it's also the empty tomb. So if you had a theology of pastoral ministry that is really gospel ministry, it would have to be grounded in both the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And so consider the glory. And in Philippians 3, verses 10 and 11, that statement I'm taking is a summary of a theology of pastoral ministry. You'll notice the apostle does not begin with the suffering, but with the glory. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. That's where he begins his statement. And if that seems somewhat surprising and, po and possibly uh, out of chronology, I think it helps to remember that this is the way that Paul came to know Christ himself. Not at the cross, literally, but on the Damascus Road when it was a vision of the risen Christ. And in this statement, Paul not only begins with glory, but ends with glory. He ends verse 11 by hoping somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. The word somehow not indicating doubt as if he's uncertain about his salvation. Elsewhere, he's very emphatic about his eternal hope. But what he's expressing here is not so much doubt as amazement, amazement that God would raise a sinful man like him from the dead. 
And yet this is precisely what Paul wanted to know, God's resurrection power. And what is the power of the resurrection? I believe it is the life-giving power of God the Holy Spirit. And so this is where our Christ-centered theology of pastoral ministry also opens out to become a Trinitarian theology of pastoral ministry. For the Scripture teaches that through the spirit of holiness, Christ was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. That's Romans chapter 1. It teaches us that the Holy Spirit is the effective transforming agent of God's resurrection power. That was true for Christ. It is true also for the Christian and for the minister of the gospel. As Paul later wrote, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. That's Romans chapter 8. It's a connection between the the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit in the life of Christ and also in the life of the believer. The Spirit who brought Jesus back to life vitalizes and revitalizes the believer in Christ. And so to know the power of the resurrection, I believe, is to know the power of the Holy Spirit. And when Paul announces his desire to know resurrection power, he is announcing his intention to live and to minister by the power of God's Spirit. There is no greater power than that. It's the resurrection that gives power for gospel ministry. And this was true in the ministry of Christ himself. See, it was not until his resurrection from the dead that the preaching of Jesus achieved its lasting effect. Prior to that time, his followers remained uncertain of his identity. They lacked courage to live for his cause. It was only when Christ was raised from the dead by the power of the Spirit that they came to a full understanding of his saving work. And then once the apostles believed in that risen Christ, they were commissioned to go out with his saving message. That message was the good news of salvation through the cross and through the empty tomb. The the resurrection that Paul's talking about here in Philippians 3 is is constitutive of the apostolic preaching. As we see Peter preaching in, in Jerusalem, and later as we see Paul preaching in places like Pisidian Antioch, it's not simply the cross, but it is also the empty tomb that is animating their presentation of the gospel. We are witnesses, the apostles said, and what they meant by that was eyewitnesses of the resurrection and of the risen Christ. And so the resurrection is significant for the apostles simply in terms of the message. That is their gospel message, but it's important to the apostles for another reason. It's not simply the basis for their message, it is also the source of their power. They came preaching in power and in the Holy Spirit because the same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead was now at work in their ministry of the gospel. Jesus ascended to glory and from the place of exaltation, he sent out his Spirit. And this is why it seems very strange to us, but it's true that He promised his disciples that they would accomplish even greater things by faith than he had done. It was because he was sending them his Holy Spirit so that the very power of his resurrection would be at work in their ministry. Now we have seen earlier when we were talking about suffering that the ministry of the Old Testament prophets was marked primarily by humiliation. And the same thing can be said of Christ that up to the time of his death it was all humiliation, but everything changed at the resurrection and with the ascension when the Spirit was unleashed in all of His power. And now to this day, the ministry of the gospel comes with God's power to save sinners. You see, the practical theology that is outlined for us in Philippians chapter 3 is not just a theology of the cross, it is also a theology of glory, and it is a theology of glory in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit coming to inaugurate the glories of the coming age. And this is the source of any and all effective gospel ministry, the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit who has the power to regenerate, as Paul experienced in his own conversion. In in Paul's ministry of the gospel, the same Spirit came with with power to convert others. It was at work in his preaching to bring spiritual life from spiritual death. It's the proclamation of God's Word in the power of the Holy Spirit that enables sinners to receive eternal life by the Spirit. 
The Spirit also has the power to sanctify. He's at work through gospel ministry to bring holiness, not just salvation and con conversion, but also holiness and sanctification. Sanctification is not moral progress by human effort, but a living out of the implications of union with Christ. And Paul had experienced this as well. He was growing in godliness, and on the basis of his own spiritual experience, he said, those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what that nature de desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. And this brings them life and peace. And in that very passage, this is Romans chapter 8, he makes it clear that this sanctifying Spirit is the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead. And so just as Christ himself relied on the Spirit for his own resurrection, so too the minister united to Christ relies on the Spirit to animate the dead with new spiritual life. This is the power that delivers people from bondage to sexual sin, that tears down proud idolatries, that reconciles broken marriages, that resolves church conflicts and does all of the other things in ministry that seem impossible. And so it is that the pastor who understands the power of the resurrection in the life of the Spirit prays as Paul prayed for the blessing of the Spirit. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know His incomparably great power for us who believe, the working of His mighty strength, which He exerted in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. Another way to say this is that Paul wanted others to know what he knew, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ in a life of gospel holiness. And so I am saying that if you consider the aspect of glory in the life of pastoral ministry, it comes by the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit. That's true in conversion. It's true in sanctification. And it is true in everything else that a pastor does. It's the sovereign work of God's Spirit that answers pastoral prayer. That transforms sinners through the private application of biblical teaching. That makes baptism an effectual sign of God's saving grace. That makes Christ present in the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper. It's the Spirit who does these things. It's the Spirit who enables us to interpret the Word and apply the Word. I think of the words that Charles Spurgeon is reported to have said as he mounted each of the 15 steps to the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London saying, I believe in the Holy Ghost, as he went into the pulpit. He was conducting his ministry in union with Christ, who is present in the church by his living spirit. And wonderful to say, the power of the spirit is at work not only in a pastor's evident successes, if he has some, but also in apparent failures. And here again, the example is the Apostle Paul, who especially when he faced difficulty in ministry was compelled to depend on the, on the Holy Spirit. He certainly did that in his preaching. He often preached, he said, in weakness and fear with much trembling, and yet the message came with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So that what, what happened through that ministry would rest not on human wisdom, but on God's power. And what was true of his preaching was true of his ministry generally. He said to his friends, he was talking about the hardships that he had faced in ministry in Asia. He, in Asia, he said, we're under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired even of life itself. And yet God had a sovereign purpose in that experience of sharing in the sufferings of Christ. And so Paul goes on to say, this happened that we might not rely on ourselves but on God who raises the dead. Do you see it again? Paul always going back to the cross and the empty tomb. This is the, the foundation. This is the ground out of which he works out his gospel ministry. It is the gospel work of Jesus Christ, sharing in the power of the cross and the empty tomb. And as he ministered this way, in union with Christ, Paul experienced both humiliation and exaltation, and often it was the humiliation that compelled him to rely more completely on the exalting power of God's Spirit. These two things are connected in the life of ministry. They're not separated, but they are united. The weakness that the apostle suffered served to demonstrate the glory of the grace of God. This is why Paul boasted about his weaknesses, so that Christ's power would rest on him. That's why he said, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, in all of those things having to do with suffering. For when I am weak, 
then I am strong. You see again how pervasively Paul views the sufferings and the glory of his ministry from the vantage point of the cross and the empty tomb. He is always taking himself back to the gospel in his experience of ministry. And all of these things strengthened his grasp on the resurrection power of God. He was crucified in weakness. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him. Yet by God's power, we will live with him to serve you. You see, it is partly through his suffering that Paul came to know Christ in the power of his resurrection. And Christ has already suffered his humiliation and entered his exaltation. We're one step behind, as it were. We're still living in the not yet of the already, still waiting to be exalted. And it is some encouragement for us to know as we suffer that Christ has passed this way before. But more than that, we now have the presence of the risen and exalted Christ to sustain us and comfort us in our humiliation. This is the glory that Paul was experiencing. A time is coming when the resurrection will raise us beyond all suffering. But in the meantime, we experience the power of his grace. This is what enables us to persevere. And finally, the Holy Spirit has the power to glorify. In addition to all of the other things that the Spirit has the power to do in ministry, he has the power to glorify. And here it must be emphasized that the greatest glories of preaching and of pastoral ministry are deferred benefits. It was true in the ministry of Christ. I, earlier I noted his sufferings and I took those words from Isaiah 49 and said, these are the words of the suffering servant. They are the words of the Messiah. I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Those are the words that Christ might speak at the point of the cross. And yet the servant goes on in the next verse to say this, in expectation of his coming exaltation, what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. You see the, the expectation that the Savior had of the fruit of his ministry, and do you see the practical implications that has as we labor and as we suffer in the ministry of the gospel? You see the same movement from suffering to glory in Isaiah 53. It was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. But after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. And I will give him a portion among the great. This is the movement of ministry in the life of Christ from suffering to glory. And that hope of deferred glory ought to be of particular encouragement to pastors who are discouraged by their apparent fruitlessness in gospel ministry. The exaltation will come only after the humiliation. And so the, the gospel minister laboring in a field with the hope of a harvest that will not be reaped until eternity waits for that harvest. That is the point when a ministry of suffering will be revealed as a ministry of glory. So it was that the Puritan Richard Sibbs advised ministers to wait for the rewards of their ministry. Let us commit the fame and credit of what we are or do to God. He will take care of that. Let us take care to be and to do as we should. And then for noise and report, let it be good or ill as God will send it. Let us labor to be good in secret. We should be carried with the Spirit of God and a holy desire to serve God and our brothers and to do all the good we can and never care for the speeches of the world. We will have enough glory by and by. Somewhere Charles Spurgeon made essentially the same point in more epigrammatic fashion. Set small store by present rewards. Be grateful for earnests along the way, but look for the recompensing joy hereafter. And that's what Paul was looking for, that recompensing joy. He had a future-oriented definition of success in ministry. He did not think that he had fully grasped the knowledge of Christ. He goes on to say after verses 10 and 11 in chapter 3 that he was pressing on toward the goal to win the prize. Elsewhere he said, we eagerly await a Savior from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. You see, Paul is 
looking forward. He's anticipating the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit, not just for his own glorification, but also for the glorification of the church. And this is the ultimate goal and crowning glory of any preaching ministry, to present the elect unto God to receive their inher eternal inheritance. For what is our hope? What is our joy? What is our crown? Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. And so the exaltation of a pastoral ministry may be rarely glimpsed in this life, will only be fully displayed at the second coming when God will reveal his son in the risen church and when somehow we attain to that resurrection, we will know the glory of God beyond all measure. Thank you, and we'll have a time of questions and answers. Thank you very much, Dr. Reichen. Well, why don't we uh, move our way towards the mics? Uh, we've got mics on either side. Um, as as uh, some people move that way, a lot of questions uh, stirring in my mind. Um, I think of, uh, for example, Luther. I think of a couple of things of Luther. Uh, that what makes a theologian? What are those three things? The, the, the prayer, the meditation, and the triumph. And it really it, it's, it's what he said. Or even contrasting the theology of the cross and the theology of glory. Um, it seems like they don't necessarily happen consecutively always. But rather, what you said, that the theology of glory comes through the theology of suffering. So it's the means by which God's glory and surpassing greatness is seen. Yeah, let me comment on both of those things. They're both, both good comments. I, and just an autobiographical comment. I mean, I, I remember hearing probably already when I was in college and, and really had a strong sense of call to pastoral ministry. Um, a, a good friend and mentor talking about if, if he were going to sit under a preaching ministry, he really wanted to sit under a preaching ministry of someone who had suffered. And I found that to be a, a very intimidating comment as somebody who hadn't gone through a lot of suffering. Um, and my, my conviction is the main thing you need to sit under in a preaching ministry is somebody who will teach you the Word of God. But, but there is a sensibility to that. I think what you find in ministry is that you go through the trials. I mean, you're going to have the trials. And, and so the sufferings will come. You don't need to sort of force the issue or feel like you're second rate because you haven't suffered as much as somebody else has suffered or something like that. But it is, in large measure, the trials that do, uh, you know, help bring that, that sanctification and that perspective. I'm glad for your comment about a theology of glory in two respects. One is to be clear that whenever we're talking about the gospel, we're talking about both the cross and the empty tomb. It's crucifixion and resurrection. And part of my conviction about preaching is that anytime I'm, I'm preaching, I want to bring in both of those elements so that it is really gospel preaching in the full sense of the word. I think um, I'm not a Luther scholar. Luther is known for his theology of the cross and that strong emphasis. I think you'll also find some important things about a theology of glory in Luther, even though he's maybe not quite as well known for that. But the point you're making, I think, is a very important point, that it is always both and. It's not consecutive. It's not either or, but it's both of those things in close connection. And that's one of the reasons I ended kind of as I did talking about, in talking about the glory, talking about Paul's experience of that glory in the context of his suffering so that, that those things are brought together in life and ministry. Someone, okay, right there. Uh, let me follow up, if I could, just one last thing. And that is, isn't that, we, are, we, we didn't hear that truth when you were going through seminary, and you were being involved, uh, you know, being raised in a local church, and the suffering aspect of it? Was it that it was being ignored? Was it that you didn't have ears to hear? Or was it that you thought you were the exception? Yeah, so um, I guess what I would say is that I, I think, um, you know, we live in very comfortable circumstances. We are touched by the reality of death, of course, and of physical disease and so forth and broken relationships. My own personal experience is a life of great blessing with very little suffering or hardship um, kind of in my growing up years. So it's partly, you know, mostly life context. What I would say, though, is that when you, when you look at the New Testament, 
there is such a very strong emphasis on suffering. Um, and I, I'm not sure we always pick up on that, and it may be partly because you sort of notice the things that you've experienced and connect with. So, if, but maybe, maybe others have had very different experiences uh, altogether. I, I think it's probably generally true, though. I mean, I think when you're in seminary particularly, you're probably idealistic. You, I mean, you're going to change the world through, you know, gospel ministry. It's good to be idealistic. Um, I don't know that a lot of people are talking to you in a healthy way about all of the sufferings of the ministry, you know, as often as they might do. Uh, that, that was probably my experience. Yes? Sometimes when people suffer, they really have a powerful sense of the presence of the Lord. But I'd say more often, it's the opposite. It's as though in suffering, we feel as though we know Christ the least, uh, quite often. And um, I'm curious how that fits with this, uh, you know, stirring uh, word from Paul. And also, what is it that we know about Christ better uh, once we've suffered? What, what spiritual wisdom does that accrue to us? Yeah, those are both great questions. Um, a couple of comments on seeing Christ the least in our suffering, um, which, which is often the case. I mean, certainly see that a lot in pastoral ministry. Um, those can be some of the hardest times to experience the presence of Christ. Um, and I, I would say one reason why it's important to see the biblical story of ministry and the large amount of suffering that's involved in it is so that when we come to times of suffering, we won't be surprised and, and say, this isn't part of the deal. This isn't part of what, what I have coming to me. But that we will already say, no, these are the things that I can expect to experience in life and ministry. This is part of it. And, and even that preparation I think helps prepare us for the blessings that God will have for us in that context. I would also say that, the, to me, the most important thing to do in, in times where you have a sense of the absence of God, particularly in suffering, and he does not seem to be close, is particularly then to go to the cross, as we should always do, but particularly to the experience of Christ, who knows what it is like to experience that abandonment and who prays to the Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And experiences himself in ways that are unfathomable mysteries, that sense of the absence of God. And yet even in that time is still crying out to the Father and also trusting the Father because he says, into your hands I commit my spirit. So that... That's particularly when we may need to be pointed to or we may need to help others be pointed to the, to the cross and to the sufferings of Christ as the place where we need to go with that sense of the absence of God. What is it that we, uh, that we learn about, about Christ through our sufferings? And probably, you know, it would, it'll be different for each circumstance of suffering, but here are some of the things that we, that we learn. Uh, that even in the worst suffering that... God is still there. Uh, we learn that, we learn in a deeper way what it is that Jesus himself has suffered because I think it's easy for us to trivialize the sufferings of Christ, not have a very full picture of what that involves. But when you go through different kinds of suffering in life, when you are rejected by people that you have poured out your life for, uh, when you go through physical pain and, and difficulty, when you suffer broken relationships, when you go through the various kinds of, when you are mocked and persecuted, when you go through the whole range of different sufferings, there's always an aspect of Christ's suffering, his humiliation, that you now are drawn closer to in terms of your understanding of those sufferings, but also you now can see Christ is able to sympathize with me, intercede for me, because he knows from the inside what it is like to go through this kind of suffering. So those would be just, I mean, that would just be the start of an answer for uh, what it is that we, that we learn about God or learn about Christ um, in suffering.
uh, right now in India, there's uh, there are Christians that are being uh, persecuted, and uh, there are Christians that have died. And although I'm not privy to all the facts, I wouldn't be surprised if some pastors may have also been killed uh, with respect to the uh, Hindu riots right now. Uh, we see a similar situation in a mission field as well, where uh, mission agencies are very aware of the dangers that missionaries will insert themselves into and therefore prepare contingency plans to rescue missionaries should persecution and uh, in some cases extreme suffering occur as well. My question is how does a Christian, whether in pastoral ministry or whether a missionary faithfully follow the call to suffering and follow Christ when it seems that in the heat of the situation you have stark realities such as your family, your health. Does one continue onward to submit oneself to persecution and riots and death, or does one take flight? And therefore, by taking flight, uh, in some probability, may personally draw criticism from other Christians who might say, well, you are called to suffer and participate in Christ's suffering. Why are you fleeing from that kind of a suffering? How does one rightly discern and know what is to happen and make decisions in the midst of these kinds of realities? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll tell you the place where I feel the bite of that the most in my own personal life. I have a strong conviction that children should not be sacrificed on the altar of ministry. Um, partly having grown up in an evangelical community, also, my wife grew up in an evangelical community with a lot of people in ministry. We had both seen some great examples of family life and ministry, and also some things that we really, our observation was, were very healthy for that reason, that people sort of sacrificed uh, their families for ministry because, you know, it was for God and it was an appropriate sacrifice and all that. There's always a justification. And then on the other hand, um, so I have a strong conviction about that, um, but there are also inevitably are uh, effects that ministry does have on your family. And times when you, you see a situation developing and you feel like your own children, I certainly have had situations like this, are suffering in some degree for a calling that they themselves have not chosen in life that's part of their family situation. So that, just in my circumstances, that's where I feel uh, the bite of that, of that question. Of course, it comes up most acutely for for pastors, including, you know, people with whom I have close friendships overseas, who are not unlikely, in some cases, even to be killed for their faith. I mean, I'm thinking of particular people that if and when I ever get a call that they have been martyred for their faith, it will not be a surprise either to them or to their families or to me. And how do you discern when it is right and godly to, um, to protect yourself. I mean, biblically, there is a you know, le legitimate right of self-preservation. I think the question will always come down to this. It is, if I leave this situation, am I exercising faithfulness in my calling? And my calling includes perhaps gospel ministry, but I do have a calling as a husband and father, and that has a very... Uh, very heavy and weighty priority, I would say. I mean, I, my personal view is my family has a priority, and my, my role as a husband and father has a closer immediacy than my role as a shepherd in a church. That's probably a debatable, arguable point. I don't even know if I could fully develop that from Scripture, but that would just be kind of my, my instinct. Um, am I exercising faithfulness in my calling as a pastor and as a father and husband, whatever other callings, or by leaving a situation that can maybe save my life, um, 
am I being faithless? Somewhere I have read, and I wish I could remember where, some analysis from someone in the third world about the difference between a situation in which a pastor himself is particularly the target of something life-threatening and where he, by removing himself from that, can protect himself, the difference between that situation and one where really the whole congregation is a target. And in the latter situation, it is really faithless. This was the argument that was being developed to leave the situation because it's not just sort of faithfully protecting yourself so that you will be able to continue to serve the Lord beyond that. But actually, other people are in danger, and you need to be right on the front line of sacrificing yourself for that. Maybe that's a helpful distinction. It might be worth, um, might be worth thinking about. I would say that in evangelical circles, um, it does seem to me that sometimes people have the kind of attitude, if I'm suffering in this situation then this must be the right place for me to be because I'm, I'm expecting to, do, to suffer for the Lord. Sometimes get this. Um, just because you're suffering or in danger doesn't mean that you're necessarily in the place where you ought to be. I think it always comes back to what is faithful and what is faithless in, a diff, in, in different situations. That's probably all the criteria I can give right now to what is a, a great question. Thanks, Phil. That was a wonderful talk, very edifying, very timely. Um, I have a similar question to the one that was just asked. It's a personal application question. And it really does come out of a lot of struggle in my own life with some of the same biblical and historical theology that you presented today. You made a point in passing. It wasn't a major point to the effect that we don't schedule our own suffering and we shouldn't go out looking for suffering. And that's a point well taken. I don't disagree with that. But in my own life and my own struggle to be more like Christ and to share in his suffering, I have found that if I'm not intentional in some way about living a cruciform life, a self-sacrificial, self-giving life for others, there really are times when my sinful instinct to preserve my own time and energy and health and stuff kind of takes over and gets in the way, it seems to me, of my uh, applying these Pauline truths, maybe in the way that the Lord has uh, for me. And I wonder if that's something you struggle with too, if you have any thoughts, you know, with regard to taking this down to a very personal level, you know, how, how can we go about the business of uh, becoming more Christ-like disciples in these ways. Is it, is it um, inappropriate of me, you think, to say, even though I don't go out looking for tragedy, I really ought to go about my Christian ministry each day intentional about being self-giving so that these other instincts don't prevail? Yes, absolutely. I, I agree strongly with the point. It's uh, a helpful one. I think I talked a little bit about death to self, but here's another category of ongoing um, humiliation and suffering, which is self-giving, not just self-dying, but self-giving, and self-giving usually involves some dying to self, so the two are very closely related. I think one of the ways we can be sure that we're going to engage in suffering at some level is when we devote ourselves to serving others, because when we do that, it will, it will take its cost from us, maybe a financial cost in some situations, certainly a cost of time, energy, affection. And furthermore, the, the, the more that we are moving towards others in loving relationships, then the bigger impact that their sufferings will have on us. So it, it works at a couple of different levels. So I, I just, I think it's a very helpful point that um, if we want to experience this self-giving and sacrifice that's in the, real, in the area of suffering and death broadly construed, that being intentional about giving ourselves to others is going to help us learn these very lessons. And that's a very good practical way for us to do it, even if we're not in any acute suffering at the moment. And that's one of the reasons why pastoral ministry is 
um, you know, one of the places where you experience a lot of suffering because you're called to, to give yourself in love to the people that God has given you to love, and you then share in the full range of their burdens. Um, and I, let me just also agree with what I took to be a little bit of the sense of your question is the, the impulse towards self-preservation is a very strong one. Protecting my time. Um, protecting, I'm, I'm willing to, and I, what I find in, is just for myself, and I think many other people in, in pastoral ministry, I find this, we're much more comfortable fitting in our commitment and service to God around our agenda. My agenda is here, and I'll, if I can fit it in, then I'll fit it in, which is very different than setting aside my agenda at times because it's really God's agenda. I will also say in pastoral ministry, the hard questions that I face aren't so much between me time and serving time. It's making decisions between all of the other people that have a legitimate claim on my time. My children have a legitimate claim on that. My wife has a legitimate claim on that. Um, I do preserve my preparation for preaching time. I guard that very jealously because that's time that I owe to the whole congregation. But um, you, you touched a little bit on agenda, time agenda. It got me thinking about you know, some of those issues as well. Um, I had a question. Uh, wondering whether there should be a distinction in our minds between suffering in general, because we're in a fallen creation, um, and we feel the effects of that fall everywhere, and what you called about fellowship in the sufferings of Christ. And I'm particularly trying to connect the dots between the cross, taking up the cross, and sharing in the sufferings of Christ. In other words, are there specific... Uh, one possible idea is that what defines fellowship in the cross is the willingness to take up the commands of Christ even at great suffering. So I'm wondering, is that a way, should we make the distinction? I guess that's my first question. So that we're not just talking about general suffering, we are talking about something specifically mission or Christocentric or whatever we want to define it. And then secondly, how does it link with uh, the commands of Christ or taking up one's cross and following Jesus? Right. So I think, um, again, a great question. I think I think there is something to that distinction. There's suffering in general, common to humanity, and there's something more particular that Paul and others in the New Testament are talking about, suffering for the sake of Christ, which seems to be in the context of ministry or any way, any way of faithfulness to God in service to God. Maybe obedience to commandments would be uh, one good way of thinking about that. So suffering for the cause of Christ um, you know, is, is not just... Um, you know, spraining my ankle. Um, it's something I, that actually happens to me because of my faithfulness uh, in service to Christ. So I think that's a legitimate um, distinction. And I think the, kind of the language of the New Testament would kind of push us in this category of, of suffering for the cause of Christ. So similarly, you know, people will use the language of, I, ju I guess that's just my cross to bear, and they're talking about, you know, a difficult mother-in-law or something like that that's kind of very situational. It doesn't have anything uniquely to do with their commitment to Christ. Now, having said that, I do think that there's a sense in which all of our sufferings in a fallen world need to be worked out in our relationship with Christ and when we're thinking from a Christ-centered perspective, I think we're pretty quickly going to be drawn into that fellowship, even if maybe it's not narrowly construed what Paul is talking about. But, um, I mean, when we suffer um, just, I mean, the ravages of natural disasters in a fallen world, there's suffering that goes with that. But very quickly... Um, th that's certainly a place where we experience the ministry of Christ in that suffering. So there is a sense of communion with Christ that would be true for the believer in that context. But then whatever the situation is, as we begin to exercise gospel faithfulness in that situation, we may very quickly be drawn into the more, 
fellowship of sharing in Christ's sufferings very narrowly. So in that relationship with the difficult mother-in-law, there are choices, which I don't have, by the way, if my mother-in-law ever hears this. Uh, I'm just using it as a stereotype, Elaine. Um, the, uh, it, if I then make choices in the direction of faithfulness to God in that relationship, they may be choices that demand a lot of cost from me and I'm very quickly into legitimately that area of fellowship with, uh, with the sufferings of Christ. I think, I think from what we see in the scriptures, the more faithfully that we are bold in our witness for Christ, the more faithfully that we are really extending ourselves in sacrificial ways for the needs of the poor and reaching out to people who are suffering, the, the more we move in the direction of faithfulness to Christ, the more we will be drawn into the sufferings of Christ just by virtue of what it's like to be in a fallen world and to do redemptive work in that fallen world. Another one? Is that right? Um, a question that I wrestle with very personally and otherwise is that you touched on it a little bit. Um, if we don't suffer, is there something wrong? And I realize that may not necessarily just be a, um, you know, kind of an individualistic question. It may be a structural question. It may be a question of the compromise of evangelicalism or the larger question of whether we have bought into too many things that we, haven't, that we shouldn't buy into. But that's a very real question for me. If, if with all of this emphasis on the cross and suffering and uh, other things, is there, do you think there's an element of uh, warning or danger here when we say well, if we don't suffer? I would say that the, again, a great question. I think the Bible encourages us in many ways to be thankful for the blessings of life. Good health, uh, feasting, everything is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving and with prayer in the ministry of the word. I mean, that's what Paul says to Timothy. So we shouldn't labor under false guilt for uh, the comfort of a life that is blessed by God. Um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't feel guilty for um, not in going through particular kinds of suffering. However, I would, I would feel strongly that we should be experiencing in very tangible ways sacrifice sacrifice of material goods, sacrifice of time, emotion, affection. I mean, we should be, and if you want to put that in the category of suffering, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't, I suppose. And I like, um, I like C.S. Lewis's comment about material prosperity. How much should you give, uh, you know, to kingdom work? That's not the, exactly the phrase he used. Well, I, he said, I, I don't know. I can't tell you how much you should give, I, but I know that if you're not at a place where you're really conscious that you're making choices that involve sacrifice, then you're not at the place in giving where you should, where you should be. Very broadly paraphrased. C.S. Lewis says something like that. Uh, so I would, I would say that about sacrifice. I would also say that then a good question to ask ourselves would be, am I really in loving relationships of fellowship in the way that the New Testament talks about those relationships? Because if I'm in those relationships, I'm, I should be in relationships where I'm weeping with those who are weeping. And, um, you know, am I engaged, I'll say it again, with the needs of the poor in my community? Because that's a place where I'm going to be drawn into suffering. Um, so I would say, I, I'm, I don't want to, I, I want to be cautious against false guilt uh, and um, a wrong kind of asceticism that does not rejoice in the blessings of God. But I want to agree with your discomfort and also say that's where we need to be examining ourselves to see if we're really living out a gospel life. And that may be an indicator that we're, we're missing some key areas of, of faithfulness and obedience. Um, I guess um, my question is probably... Um, uh, was maybe answered a little bit in previous questions, but uh, I was wondering, for example, about uh, fasting. So um, it seems to me that it is, um, I mean, self-denial, probably like other things, but uh, 
I also feel it's more um, of a voluntary thing, you know, because like if, if you're in the pastoral ministry and people come up to you with needs or, you know, take your time, I mean, you're not, I mean, you d didn't decide to do it, but like, yeah, for, let's say fasting, which is more of a voluntary thing, so how do you, um, how do you decide about voluntary suffering, say? Okay. Yeah, good question, and, and frankly, one not talked about enough, I think, in evangelical cir circles in America. If you look at the New Testament and the teaching of Jesus on fasting, for example, um, it, it gives a strong impression that fasting is a pretty regular part of the life of discipleship. Clearly not presented as a law, any kind of legalistic or meritorious righteousness, but as an expression of our dependence upon God as a reminder to prayer, um, as a practice of self-denial, I think the New Testament perspective is it, it's just kind of an ordinary and regular healthy part of the life of discipleship. So that's why I'm glad for the question. I would recommend uh, John Piper's book on fasting, which I think is very good and has some historical uh, sources in the back of it, kind of from the rich, riches of past ages of the church, some helpful comments on fasting. Also, there's a great essay, not very well known, by Thomas Boston, who's kind of a uh, Scottish Presbyterian, kind of a late Puritan, has a very good uh, treatise on fasting. Um, and I would put fasting in the category, as you did, of self-denial and, um, and, and then I, I would put it with death to self, self-giving as practical ways of entering into uh, an experience of death that relates to uh, what it means to share in the fellowship of Christ's suffering. So maybe another practical way that we can be entering into some of those experiences. Um, we, we typically, at Tenth Presbyterian Church, we don't practice fasting as a sort of church-wide exercise, but it is something that our elders do on on various occasions as a call to prayer and expression of dependence upon God um, as, you know, part of our discipleship and leadership of the church. And um, so I'm glad for the question because I think it's a neglected aspect of discipleship. And Dr. Riken, um, in response or kind of piggybacking off what the gentleman said earlier about feeling kind of bad for not suffering, kind of guilty. What do you do in a context of, of inner city ministry in particular, which is close to where 10th is, where there is a theology that teaches that suffering is not only to be avoided, but is wrong. You know, the health, wealth thing, um, prosperity type teaching. Um, everyone I talk to uh, from home, lady called last night, uh, I ministered to her many years ago, older lady. How are you doing? You know, I'm blessed and highly favored is, is the terminology. And that simply means that everything is going great, and that's the blessing of God. That's God honoring my life because not only do I, um, I don't have hardships, but um, everything is going swell. And, you know, and, of course, you're familiar with that theology. I mean, it's, but it's everywhere. Everybody I talk to, um, they are taught Jake's dollar. Uh, and all the other guys are, are teaching the community that, hey, you shouldn't be suffering. It's wrong. It's sinful to be suffering or be persecuted. What would you do with that? I mean, you're in Philadelphia. You know that. <laughs> yep. So uh, another very good question. I mean, the first thing I think of is uh, the, some of the things that Jim Baker wrote uh, when he was in prison. Uh, you know, he had been all caught up in this with his television ministry and so forth. And he went back and really started studying the Bible in prison. And he asked himself, how could I possibly have missed everything that the Bible says about the dangers of financial prosperity particularly, but also all the things that the Bible says about the life of suffering? So I think in terms of our own kind of ministry context, if we're in a church, the main thing is just be faithful in teaching the scriptures and the full range of what the scriptures say about money, prosperity, suffering, illness, 
um, you know, all of those kinds of things. I don't know that somebody that's really caught up in kind of prosperity teaching in sort of a television ministry or maybe in their own uh, congregation that you're, you're necessarily going to make that much headway if that's the dominant teaching and perspective they're getting. I think it's going to be an uphill climb. I would, I would just say that the problem there is a sort of theology of, of glory without a theology of the cross. So, I mean, taking people back to the gospel to see what the ministry of Christ was all about is an important thing. And it's also, it's an over-realized eschatology. We want to bring heaven back into our earthly experience now without realizing that we're still in a place of pilgrimage, we're still in a place of suffering, and we are waiting for glories that have yet to be revealed. So it's a misunderstanding of the character of the ministry of Christ and of the gospel. It's a wrong expectation of what life in a fallen world uh, is really going to be like. And it's a misunderstanding of what time it is in redemptive history. We're not at the, we're not at the place of, of the full glory and blessing. We're still in the place where there's a lot of suffering involved. Um, I, think the, I think the most helpful thing is just our ongoing teaching of the scriptures. But I will say this, that uh, particularly, I mean, I'll just comment on Philadelphia, particularly in the African-American community, there are a lot of people that are really dying for sound teaching of scripture. And when they receive it, they rejoice in it because they... They've heard a lot of other things uh, in some of the, the pulpits in Philadelphia, and it's very refreshing because all along the way, there has been a kind of cognitive dissonance. I know I'm supposed to be happy, wealthy, healthy, prosperous, but my ra- reality is I'm struggling with a lot of those things. I, and there, there's such a disconnect there that when you actually get a healthy theology and teaching of the Bible that integrates those and helps you make sense of those things, it just brings a lot of joy. Um, so we should continue to teach those things. I guess that's what I'm saying. Thank you. Let's thank you.